Let's see the breakfast in Plus TV Africa. We'll take you through the pages of a national dailies. Uh, we'll start off with the leadership newspaper this morning. And all things being equal, we have a guest join the conversation uh, as we proceed. I'd like to start off with the leadership, like I mentioned earlier on, and the focus would be on the top captions, uh, top or banned caption this morning on the leadership. Growing insecurity threatening 2023 general elections. That's what INEC is saying. And all eyes are on Nigeria for credible polls. The United States is quoted on that. Free critical press essential for consolidation of democracy. INEC must be shielded from political interference. This is what civil society organizations yeah. are quoted to say. Uh, you also have a strike federal government as to renegotiate the 20, uh, 2009 agreement. It's interesting that uh, the federal government will want to be uh, with ASO, go back to the 2009 agreement to renegotiate. How many years after? Why there is general blackout, according to the minister, saying that uh, due to lack of water, the dry season, that's why Nigerians are facing blackout. So, I mean, I'm asking the generation issue, how much are we generating in terms of, you know, the generating company, the gents calls and the discos. Well, oil prices hit $117 as buyers reject supply from Russia. Mm. Ex Attorney General of the Federation Adoke writes Malami and denies alleged complicity in JP Morgan's case. Russian Ukraine war airlift of Nigerians rescheduled for today. I thought Nigerians had already been airlifted. Federal government files criminal charges against Abiy Kari. Uh, that's what you find. Federal government files criminal charges against Abiy Kari. And foreign education reps reject bill to regulate children out of public uh, offices. Take that again. Reps reject bill to regulate children of public offices uh, going to this foreign institution. That's the much we can take on the leadership this morning. Uh, moving away from the leadership, uh, we're, our next up uh, is the Punch newspaper. The lead story there, governors fume over a falling fact funds carpet. NNPC, uh, with some writers there, NNPC not meeting FAC obligation but declaring profit, oil sector opaque. That's according to the governor of Equity State, Kayo De Fayemi. Uh, firm's zero remittance shows Nigeria's bankruptcy, according to the Ondo State governor, Akiri Dolu. Now, fuel scarcity not abating. Those are the stories uh, on um, the front page of the Punch newspaper, but just above the masthead. Uh, Nigeria failed to increase export diversification over time, says IMF. NDLEA charges uh, may stall Abakari's extradition to U.S. Mercy, you, you remember when I mentioned that. Federal government can't extradite and meet pending charges. Uh, senior advocate of Nigerians are quoted on that one. Uh, Federal government has no funds to meet ASO's demand, according to the Minister of Employment, Chris Ngige. Federal government airlines disagree over flight delays cancellations. Right of way stores 1,240 power project. All right, uh, Nigerian fighters must provide $1,000 for ticket visa. Ukraine is saying, okay, public officers' children free to attend schools abroad. Uh, that's according to reps. Uh, Ogun couple remanded for murder, sale of woman's head. Measles hits eight states and see the sea laments non vaccination. Just below the page there, democracy has declined on the Buhari. That's according to Yacha Ayu. A customer abates Lagos POS operator with hot soup over data. And the last story on the punch this morning on the front page that is 2023 desperate politicians may attack polling units. INEC warns. Those are the stories making headlines on the punch newspaper this Friday. Away from the punch, let's take a look at the Nation newspaper. The banner caption reads, Our concerns about 2023 general elections by INEC. You also have, There is security threat, says PDP 
and political uh, spending pushes up demand for dollar. Uh, that is a rider's underneath the board caption. Banking contributed 168.4 trillion naira to GDP in four years. Hiccups delay evacuation of Nigerians from Ukraine. Federal government asked you to renegotiate 2019 agreement. I mean, some quarters are saying 2009. Uh, Tunibu takes consultation to AKT Monarchs. That's also now the uh, head there. And petrol holders to be sanctioned, says NNPC. These are the headers on uh, the nation newspaper this morning. All right. Uh, oh, those are the papers that we have uh, this morning that we will be looking at. Uh, uh, we have uh, G. Day Johnson, Chief Lecturer of the Nigerian Institute of Journalism, joining us. Good morning to you, G. Day Johnson. Good morning, Justin, and good morning, Mess. It's a pleasure to be with you. All right, uh, thanks uh, for joining us this morning. Fine, uh, I'm sure you have um, checked out um, the dailies this morning. Uh, lots of uh, uh, stories are uh, making headlines. But let's uh, talk about INEC concerns, you know, uh, on the leadership on Friday. Uh, growing insecurity is threatening 2023 general elections. That's according to INEC. What do you make of that, Jide? Uh, that shouldn't be any. It shouldn't surprise INEC. In 2019, we had security challenges. Despite the security challenges um, from the northeast part of the country, we got wonderful results, unimaginable results from the IDP camps, from local governments that were under control of, um, of Iswap and Boko Haram. So we got results from all of these, all of these places. And one thing that is absolutely certain, when it's time for election, um, the warring faction will shoot their sword. There's no way that you can disconnect whatever is happening in Nigeria from the political class. You could see the hues and cries and the Ula Balu concerning Nanambra's election. Everybody felt the gubernatorial election in Nanambra will not take place late last year. But we saw how um, the election came and how peaceful and how all the concerns that were raised concerning the elections were allayed. So, as far as I'm concerned, there will be election in 2023. No doubt about that. You will see it will be like there has never been any major crisis in Niger State with respect of Israel making inroad in three, with banditry making inroad in Northwest, and then um, Israel gaining ground in the northeast and then the issue of kidnapping and the rest of it down south so as far as i'm concerned there will be elections because the political class are involved like this they have a stake in it and they will tell those that are involved in all of these commissions to to shoot their store so that we can have the election i've never seen them since 1999 to date any time that elections are okay. coming all right, but, some relative peace. All right, but Jide, uh, you know, although um, you are saying all of that, but the punch seems to have a bit of um, uh, a differential, per se, uh, when they captioned your own this way. Uh, they said in 2023, desperate politicians may attack polling units. The issue of that happening, I ain't exactly warning. The issue of that happening next year. Oh, there's, there's, that's... Attacking of polling units, I'll give you an example because we should not be talking on the, on the face value. We should be providing evidence to back up our, our, our reportage. That's what makes it to be precise. It's called precision journalism, or what they call data journalism now. You recall in 2019, in um, around Isolo, Okota, Axis. We saw, we saw it live on TV where elections were held and the polling... You know the president said in 2019 that whoever smashes polling boxes should be shot at sight. Yeah, he did. And we were arrested for election infractions. Um, we saw how ballot boxes were destroyed in, 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 in Okota around that axis because it was believed that people in that particular area who vote for a particular candidate that is not 
the candidate of the establishment in Lagos. And what was the outcome of those that were arrested? Nothing. And it was not only in Lagos that you had cases like that. I have, I have raised this issue over time. Have you, has anybody ever been prosecuted for election infractions? There were major election infractions in 2019. In actual sense, a governor, a former governor, or a sitting governor then, and now a senator elect, the returning officer said he was made to declare the result under duress with guns pointed on his head. Now, the electoral rule says that the result can be declared. You can't do anything to it. You go and investigate that at the tribunal. However, the criminal aspect, which does not foreclose investigation, was not done with respect to that. Who are those behind putting gun on the returning officer? So when they come, <clears throat> when they come and they tell us, you know what, um, desperate politicians, who are the politicians? The politicians that were desperate in 2019, what did you do to them? Those that were desperate in 2015, what did you do to them? So they shouldn't be heightening the tension. INEC should not be heightening the tension because they themselves have not done the NIFU with respect to providing evidences and requiring the police to ensure that all those that are involved in election violence are, are prosecuted. If, besides, there's not this stuff in INEC, even from releasing the names of those that are, 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 are being alleged to have committed election infractions. If we can't prosecute them, we could shamify them. Just publish the names that, okay, these are the people we have provided the police. You call a press conference, and you said you have called the police. You throw the, you throw the body on the police to do what is, what is required and what is needful. All right. Well, uh, let's also take a look at the leadership newspaper. It says, federal government to an ASU to renegotiate the 2009 agreement. Uh, that's how uh, the leadership captions it. Now, do you think that uh, the federal government and ASU will ever get to that point where they agree? Are they even making progress that they have to go back to renegotiate? I mean, the leadership says uh, 2009. You also have, uh, you know, the, the nation saying 2019. But the point here is going back to renegotiate an agreement that you had entered. Are we progressive? You know, the solution to that problem was the bill that was shut down in the National Assembly. Um, that the children of public officials, elected officials, should not go to school abroad. You know, if we have that, um, if we have that bill, the issue concerning our educational sector will be resolved to a large extent, not once and for all, but to a large extent. Now, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the issue of the agreement between federal government and ASU will soon pass over from this administration to the incoming administration last year. Next year, how many years? How many years? This, pres this present administration has less than one year to, to do whatever it wants to do with respect to policy implementation and execution. For me, solving ASU's problem is for us to deregulate education. One, two, decentralize education. Three, allow each of the states and each of the university governing council to determine what obtains in those institutions. I've said it. You can't expect um, the same principle that applies to University of Lagos to apply to Federal University of Oye or to apply to, to uh, a university in the Northeast or in the Northwest. They are different environment, different standard of living, different cost of living. They have their own comparative advantages and the rest of it. So Johnson, let, let, let's, let's get to that conversation. It's a good thing that you have you know, mentioned that bill that was rejected. Now, you also, in the, in the course of this conversation, have mentioned that uh, if that bill was passed, it would actually help you know, improving the educational sector. How is the question? Good. 
You, you recall during this week that Nans visited the Minister of Education. Um, um, the Minister of Education on his own, his disposition, that's just a reflection of his disposition as, as a person and the way he has treated um, issues relating to, to, to education. Um, you saw that an issue was raised by the Nans president. Well, we seem to have lost connection with uh, G.D. Johnson. As soon as we're able to have that connection, we will continue, you know, with the thoughts right here. I mean, we're, we're looking at the how because in the course of, you know, looking at the pages this morning, it was part of our top trending yes, it was. with, you know, uh, the, at this particular point again, uh, where someone, a lot of people would think that, uh, this bill, if they had actually gone ahead with this bill, it would just make us sit back and uh, analyze, I mean, sit back and have a handle of the situation in Nigeria. But he's also mentioned that um, this bill, if he was probably can see that, would help us fix the educational uh, the sector. And I wanted to have the how he was going to do that or how that's going to work. Uh, I think we do have G.D. Johnson. G.D. Johnson, the question now is, uh, you say that the bill would actually go a long way in resolving the problems and improving the educational sector if it was actually conceded. that. And the question that we're asking is how uh, will this work? How, how, will this how work? can you be serving? How can you be a public servant? <clears throat> and you say your children can't go to public schools. It is not only schools in Nigeria. It is not only schools abroad. You should send your children to to primary school, public primary school, public secondary school, and public universities. We should have that. If you are offering yourself, if indeed you really love this country, if you love to serve this country, and you love the people of Nigeria, your own children too must partake of what you are providing for an average Nigerian. So I was disappointed. Because if we do that, critical investment, critical investment will be made. Now, look at what they do to their private office, to their private offices. Look at the amount of money they vote to renovate the national. All right, uh, we'll reconnect again with um, J.D. Johnson, who seems to be have we seem to be having some connectivity issue uh, with um, him. Master, I couldn't agree, um, you know, um, more with uh, G.D. Johnson because the truth is that um, if there was a law, an extant law that says um, that all children of public office holders should school in Nigeria, there will be a turnaround in the education system because they would know that they don't have any alternative. Indeed, they would just have to fall back to fixing, you know, the, the collapse, the debt, the debris that we have uh, in the left of our educational system. Yeah, so, but, and, and that's what a lot of Nigerians are saying, and I mean, and that's the reality if you look at it logically, but uh, you also have the issue of implementation of our laws. We have several laws that have not been respected, and so even if we have that particular law, uh, will we be able to have our lawmakers abiding or, you know, living by these laws? I mean, so it would be also another issue, implementation and having enforcement. Would there be a penalty as well? So if you say, uh, you know, children, if you're a public office holder, then your kids would have to um, school in the Nigerian system. But beyond that, I'm just, I'm just, it, it's just, it calls for a lot of consent. It's just uh, quite worrisome that we have constantly not thought about the fact that for every time we leave our country, and for every time we, you pay school fees, because if you leave this country and stay outside of this country, all of the money should be spent. You're paying school fees in that country. Of you're going you're to be paying rent, system. everything, you're funding the system, and you're constantly enriching that particular mm. system. I'm also thinking that beyond making it you know, uh, compulsory, we could probably just look at it as another way. What are they doing that we cannot do? Mm. If we look at the, is it the environment? Then let's create the environment for it. ourselves. J.D. Johnson, we have you, but let's go ahead with your thoughts on this one. Yeah, some of nationalism is for you to be patriotic and love your nation and make your nation first. Now, if you really love the country, you can't send your children to school abroad. You send your children to school uh, in your home country, not private school, but public school. You recall 
in the in the in the sixties, in the seventies, and in the eighties, until the nineties, our public school system. And in actual sense, if you go to a private university, there's a way people look at you. When private university came into existence at the in the late nineties. However, today it's more fashionable for people to send their children to private universities in Nigeria now than public universities and schools abroad. Well, while we were young, if you go to school abroad in the seventies, you are regarded as someone that is not that is that is not intelligent enough, that is not brilliant enough. The universities abroad are meant for students that are not brilliant enough. You can ask people in their sixties and people in their early sixties, late fifties, and then early seventies. Ask them. That's that's the general perception of anyone that goes to school abroad in the seventies in Nigeria, that goes to school abroad, you, are, you, you, you don't have, because how many universities do we have? The admission process was, was rigorous for you to get admitted, and then we had, we, had, we had people coming all over the world to attend schools in Nigeria. Then we have a multi-diverse, we have a diverse faculty, we have what is called a university. A university, a university the, word for, the word university means a universal city. A city that you can connect the world with. That's why you get universal city. That's university. Now, do we have a universe in our educational system now? So, Jide Johnson. Yes, I'm sorry, yes. but it's still, you know, part of this. Uh, so, what is making our political office holders? I mean, why do they have to send their kids outside of this country to study? Why that exodus? Because. because because they love foreign things, they love foreign things, they, they drive foreign cars. When they are sick, they travel to abroad to seek medical help. You know how many times? Is it not insulting? Every now and then, the president will tell us that he's going, out, he's going to London for two weeks, a medical trip and whatever, for medical consultation. Uh, I think if you, do, if you do a count, the president must have gone to like 10 or 12 times that he has gone abroad for medical whatever. Is it not, have you seen the Prime Minister of Great Britain going to United States of America or going to Germany or going to neighboring France for medical? And who are those that are treating our president? How do they debrief or deconstruct? Who do they even know? What intelligence? Are these people MI15 or are they, are they CIA? Are they CIA parading themselves as medical doctors? They are critical decisions that you, you need to. So if these people travel abroad to go, they are foreign tests. That's just it. They love anything funny, they love it. The wine they drink, the rice they eat, the cars they drive, the dresses they wear, they are not they are not locally made. I, I, Look, is it just for the people. love of is it just for the love of foreign um, you know products or services or the fact that you know uh, what we have here cannot be compared to what they have over there? I mean, like I and Justin had uh, that banter this morning on top trending one of our segments on the show. Uh, we were we were asking why. Because we haven't seen, just like you have mentioned, if you look at, if you go back to some of our universities, let's talk about the universities now. The, the infrastructure, there's nothing to write home about. They are very archaic. I mean, you still find people being crowded in the 21st century, and some students do not even have a desk to sit on. So, uh, I mean, logically, would it be okay that as a, a minister or as, you know, a senator, and you have the resources that you want to send your kids to the school? Especially where they are not, I mean, I mean, because you have different ministers. I mean, you are not the minister of education. You probably would be the minister of foreign affairs. And then you can afford it. Then why send your child to, uh, you know, those kind of universities where the learning environment is not conducive. You see the way the lecturers are. I mean, the, the, there are no, the place is not lit. You don't have internet connection. There are no facilities in the lab and what have you. It's nothing really. It looks like, uh, I don't know what to describe. It feels like when the stone age. Messi. Yes. That I use Unilag as an example. Um, just look at Unilag Senate building and look at Faculty of Arts building in Unilag and Tata Arts in Unilag and the Faculty of Engineering in Unilag. Um, and then um, you just look at those monumental buildings. I'm showing you the monumental buildings that were built in the past. Now, how many monumental buildings do you have in Unilag, for example? How many hostels? Um, uh, if we sustain the level of investment we made in the university system in the 70s, in the 70s, this 
which I will call the golden age of our educational sector. Go, you can ask your reporter to go to all of these institutions and look at the monuments they have. They are all of residence. When were they constructed? When was the last time a new lecture theater was constructed? You will be shocked at what investment we have made into I agree with you, we have not made the needed investment. We have not made the needed investment that we need to put in into our educational sector across across what in terms of hostel facilities, in terms of lecture theaters, in terms of office facilities for for lecturers. But it's a product of years of neglect. And that's how you see where we started from was that federal government and answer going back to 2009. 2009 in 2022 agreement. Agreement in 2009. That was not implemented. Now, just imagine if those issues that were agreed on in 2009 have been implemented over the years. Will have incessant strike again? Not of course, but it pays government to increase the emolument of the National Assembly members, to increase the emolument of public officials, to increase the emolument of other people that are involved in the political process, but to make investment, because education is the future of any nation. Whatever investment you make in education will determine your innovation and your creativity and your productivity in the future. Now, we are not, can our students, can our students operate under the innovative economy that we have found ourselves? What is the level? In actual sense, beyond those infrastructure, let's talk about the curriculum that we use. What type of curriculum do we use to train these students? Are we training our students to compete in the 21st century? Are we training them to let them understand that they operate in a global landscape with the advent of technology and internet, that any job that is available, they can apply. If you have the skill, if you have the requisite skill, knowledge, that is required, you can apply for any job anywhere in the world. You don't have to be in United States of America to get a job in United States of America. If you have the skill in Nigeria, you get it. And for us, I usually tell my students that the jobs you are applying for in Nigeria, Nigerians in diaspora can apply for the same job if you don't equip yourself, if you limit yourself to what we teach you alone in the class. If you are not creative and innovative, you cannot operate in the present economy. Now, <coughs> how many of those lecturers that we have can use internet. How many can use smartboard? How many of them can even use? How many lecturers project their lectures? Do we even have just projectors in our lecture theaters across the schools in Nigeria? And not to even talk of smartboard. Are the classrooms accessible to internet? These are issues that we need to ask ourselves and see whether indeed we are running a nation or we are running a jungle. All right, thank you, uh, G.D. Johnson. We've actually spent so much time uh, on the education system, although which is actually very fundamental, because if we don't fix it, uh, uh, our own future, our children's future, you know, will be completely undermined. But just, let's quickly just take one uh, more story so we'll wrap up because of time. Uh, the front um, page of um, the punch, uh, governor's fume over falling fact phones, carpet, and NPC. I want to get your very thoughts concerning that uh, quickly as we wrap up. I don't know what they are forming about. MNPC is a government within the government. In fact, it's a government that is higher above the federal government. It's an institution within, within it. So even um, the National Assembly that has power over the control of budget does not have control over NNPC. The not to talk of governors that operate at the state at the state level. And that's why people have called for when the need for us to restructure. Restructure. We don't even know how many a pump of good crude oil are we exporting. How many finished products are we importing to Nigeria? And that's why you see nobody has a clue with respect to what we pay on subsidy. Not to even talk about what you get on revenue about some NPC. So governors will cry because while most of the governors are not innovative. They rely on foreign. If you want to become a governor, you are hired to be a chief executive. You must be able to take in what you have to improve your internal generated revenue. It is because we have had a lot of dependent states, and that's why some of us have prayed. And it will surely happen one day. The oil will dry. The oil will dry one day. And when that oil dries, we will use our intellect 
Nations that don't have oil, they are thriving. They are innovative and they are creative. But because we are dependent on the oil, it has, it has limited our capacity to think outside of the box and to think on how we can get, we can get trade revenue. All what governors do is to get elected, borrow money, use whatever means to get elected. And once they are elected, they don't do anything creative. They don't do any creative except to wait for the for the jack at the end of federal allocation at the end of the month. And once that allocation comes, they pay salaries and they spend the two amount of money on on, on on infrastructure and then they use the rest fighting, saying that they are security vote and the rest. They are not, they are not, they are not innovative and creative. All right. Even uh, though they are innovative and creative, we don't, don't have anything to show for it. Thank you very much, Justin and Mesty. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Julie Johnson, and we also wish you a wonderful weekend as well, and I will trust that you're going to make him the most of it. But that's as much as we can take on Off the Press. I will go back um, in time and see what happened this day in history, and we'll then go to the topic of the day, the first one, at least, um, obesity, in a moment. Stay with us. <laughs>